You're listening to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, Episode 72, Protect Yourself from Identity Theft Using Blockchain Keys with SelfKey.org, featuring guest Edmund John Lowell. Let's go. Hey, so what's up, everyone? This is your host, Ash. Thanks for tuning in to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast. I've got a return guest on today, Edmund John. If you're a longtime listener, you'll remember that I interviewed Edmund in episode 27 on flag theory and the importance of internationalizing not only your life, but your financial life as well. He owns a couple websites, passports.io, bankaccounts.io, to help you preserve and protect your wealth. Today, I brought him back on the show so he could talk to us about his most recent project, which is helping you preserve and protect your digital identity with his new company called SelfKey. So Edmund's the founder of SelfKey, and basically they help you own your digital identity with blockchain keys. Edmund, welcome back to Liberty Entrepreneurs. Ash, thanks for having me. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, Flag Theory is a business that I started in 2011, which is essentially a corporate secretarial firm. We help people set up and form companies and then obtain bank accounts for those companies. Um, and we do this with sort of a strategic internationalization plan where your first flag would be a passport, your second flag would be your residency, your third flag would be incorporation, and then you obtain a bank account for that incorporation. Then you might set up a physical asset flag, a digital asset flag, and then the seventh flag, which we pioneered, is uh, actually cryptocurrency. So in any event, if you want to hear more about that, you can flip back to episode 27 and, and uh, listen to some more there. Yeah, so Edmund, catch us up to speed here. What is your new project and how is it an evolution from the flag theory approach? I remember last time we spoke about the banking industry, which my audience knows I was in for five years at Euro Pacific Bank, eventually their head of business development. I've seen the inside workings of the offshore banking system, the pains that it has, the pains that you're trying to solve, but now you've moved on from Um, just the flag theory approach to helping solve the various pains and inefficiencies of the dreaded AML and KYC. Catch us up to speed there. And what was the evolution of the thought here? Sure. So again, we started this in 2011 and, and during that time set up hundreds of bank accounts and companies for entrepreneurs and always found that the most fain painful part of the process, both for us and our customers, was a process called KYC. So this required us to treat you know, long-term business associates and friends as essentially criminals. We'd have to collect a number of different documents that are quite invasive and personal passports. And not only was it not good enough to collect the passport, you oftentimes have to get it what's called certified, true, copied. And all of this back and forth of sensitive documents over email led me to believe that there has to be a better way to this. Around 2013, end of 2013, early 2014, I authored a white paper about the concept of using blockchain to perhaps uh, eliminate eventually and at least decrease and make more efficient the process of KYC as it currently stands. So I had that peer reviewed uh, by about 50 people. And uh, after some critical acclaim went out and started building that platform uh, with some technology. At the time we were using Bitcoin and we since uh, migrated to, to other blockchains as well, as well as private distributed ledgers and gained a wealth of experience in that space. So we incorporated a company called KYC Chain. So KYC Chain is a B2B software company that um, provides onboarding software for uh, the likes of Standard Chartered Bank and, and other regulated fintech companies, professional intermediaries, um, companies who were required to collect your identity. But what we found was that these companies who we were providing this onboarding software to weren't very willing to share this data or information with what they consider their competitors and what they considered their data. It's actually your data as the identity owner, and we can get into that. Um, But what we found is that there is a gap in the market uh, for an identity wallet, for a place where you can store your data, have confidence that no one else has access to it, and then at your request, be able to share that information with another party. So we spun out uh, this self-key identity wallet and and created a foundation that uh, we can talk about as well. So that's sort of an evolution of the story. 
Yeah, so let me break it down from my perspective as well, because Edmund and I share a very close perspective on this whole pain of AML and KYC. And for those who don't know, AML is anti-money laundering. KYC is know your client. Both are very deeply integrated into the banking and financial sector. And I want to put it in real terms for you to understand. Let's say that you want to open an offshore bank account for whatever reason. It's legal to do so, uh, but it's very painful. So if I'm the banker, which I was for many years, and you want to open up an account with me, here's the process. You apply, and then we call you on the phone for an interview, probably on Skype, a video interview. Then you have to send us an array of documents to prove your identity, to prove who you are, to prove who you're doing business with, what type of business you're doing, and in a very close estimation of the number of transactions and the volume, the size of the wires that you're going to be expected to send in and out of your account and to whom you're going to be sending them to and receiving them from. So the documents that we would require from you is a notarized passport. So you can't just send us your passport like Edmund said. You know, it has to be notarized or a cer certified original copy. But you also need to send us um, a bank reference from a bank that you've had. Usually the bank requires you to be a client of theirs for several years and remain in good standing. Who know a lot of banks don't even offer bank references anymore. And you also have to send us a certified or notarized copy of your utility bill to prove your address. Because it's illegal or it's, it's against AML and KYC regulations to offer bank accounts to certain types of people who happen or accidentally born in a certain country. And it's just, it's, it's just not fair. But for instance, your Pacific bank, we would not open bank accounts for any citizens or residents in the United States or other types of uh, totalitarian countries like Iran and North Korea. So we had to have proof where you lived. We had to have proof of your phone number. We had to have proof of your passport, of uh, your banking history, etc. So the idea that we're about to get into is how Edmund is helping you own that digital identity in a blockchain-based provable way. So you don't have to go keep getting this information every single time to give it to all these banks or financial institutions that you want to open up business with and prove every time, okay, yes, this is certified within the last three months or it's invalid. This is a way to be able to put it on a blockchain and have it provable that it is a valid certificate. Uh, did I explain that fair? Yeah, I, I think that's more than fair. I mean, I can get into more of the nitty gritty details about how we even go after those three items. So let's look at the one of the most annoying ones for people who are traveling around a lot, who might be considering themselves a nomad. It's very difficult uh, to obtain a utility bill current within the last three months if you're in an Airbnb and you're in a new country every month, right? Yeah, we're here in Chiang Mai right now. As we can hear a plane go over Niman. It's, <laughs> it's uh, you know, th there's there's a problem with that. And, and it's quite frankly, all that the bank wants to do is figure out where you're a resident. They don't necessarily need that physical utility bill. That's just the world that they live in. And and uh, what we're trying to do is build a bridge to a better world where you might be able to get an attestation of your proof of address in another way. So for instance, there's proof of physical address, which was built by Uport, um, where you can uh, have a letter sent to your address, and then you can essentially type in the code that comes in on that letter. And then in the blockchain will be what's called an attestation of that fact. So the fact that you're residing at this address and you were able to access mail there can now be proven without you necessarily having to obtain a utility bill, which, you know, is, is much more burdensome, but still accomplishes the same principle of where does this person reside? An another one that Ash mentioned was bank reference letter. I'm in the process of submitting a bank reference letter right now. It's quite annoying. You know, I, um, and, and what we can imagine in the world of blockchain and with self key is that the bank would be able to make an instant attestation and we'd actually be giving them an incentive to do so with self key with our native token key. Um, so in any event, taking these components of KYC that right now are very painful and trying to make them very easy 
and efficient is kind of our core mission. And we have three parties within this identity ecosystem that we're looking to help. There's the identity owner, which is most likely you, or it could be a small company that you own. There's the certifier. So there's whoever is certifying those documents, which you uploaded to your identity wallet. And then there's the relying party. So the relying party might be your Pacific bank or a FinTech company, a gold storage company, any company which is required to collect your information and rely upon that for the purposes of KYC. So walk us through like uh, an example of how the digital identity owner or myself, for instance, would in a theoretical world now, since I know this is still being built out, how could this change rather than me going and chasing all these notaries and trying to collect all these documents? How do, how do you see me applying for these types of financial accounts in the future using a blockchain based solution like self key? Sure. The future is not actually that far off. You can actually go to alpha.selfkey.org and you can see um, what we've proposed in terms of an identity wallet. Pretty much you'd be uploading your documents. Um, when we say upload, they'd actually be sitting locally on your device. So we don't have a central server somewhere that's collecting all of this documents and data. This is sitting locally on your machine. And because of this distributed architecture, it's much safer. No one can hack a centralized database and get access to all of the information. I'm, I'm, I'm sure we can get more into that later. But to your question, Ash, about what would this look like? Once you'd upload your documents, you'd then be able to get those documents certified or notarized. And we have notaries who are real world notaries on our system who can legally stamp and certify your documents today. And then you can go and click on marketplace, which on the top of the screen, we actually have these marketplaces up and running. Um, you can go and you can go shopping for say uh, money transmission account or remittance account. You could look for a new company. We have foundations, we have trusts, we have Bitcoin exchange accounts, we have uh, passports, we have residencies. We even have a real estate selector where you can see where in the world you can buy a piece of real estate and get a passport uh, essentially for free, although you'd have to invest in the real estate. So these different categories, and it could be any different financial services vertical, will be able to compare these companies side by side. So their fees will be very transparent. You'll be able to pick which one is right for you and which service is the best. You'll be able to see transparently what other people think about it. And then if you'd like to apply for this service, then you simply click one button and any of the information that's sitting in your identity wallet would then be securely transferred to that company. And you'd be able to have some sort of knowledge about what you'd sent to them, where they're, um, what they're doing with it, how long they're holding it, and potentially ask them to delete it when you terminated that relationship. So we're sort of trying to change the way that companies deal with your data. Yeah, so basically you're saying, hey, I want to be part of this community. There's all these service providers. And the way that I can get access, very quick, easy access to these service providers is go ahead and upload, or I guess it's not upload because it's stored locally, but get my documents approved to prove who I am, hash that, and I can share with them whatever they need to the level that they need rather than just throw in a whole bunch of my sensitive personal information. And once I sign on to this, to this community, let's say, and they sign on to, to the community, that's the negotiation. That's the handshake. It's like, okay, we're both playing by the same rules here. Once you get approved as part of this self key community, for example, it opens the door up to very quick and easy access to all these companies. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, that's correct. There, there's actually a document that governs the relationships between the parties called the trust framework. So this is a well-proven concept within identity systems. There's there's a variety of identity systems worldwide. You know, it ranges from the very centralized system of maybe uh, Aadhaar in India, which has over a billion people's biometric data sitting in a centralized database. You know, there's Equifax in the U.S. who has a centralized database of credit bureau information that was hacked very recently, and all that information was was then lost. When we think about self key and what is the difference between self key and perhaps these other more centralized uh, repositories of information, is that our system is completely decentralized, and that we as an organization, SelfKey, which is a nonprofit foundation, not only do we have no, no method or reason to profit off of your data, we, we can't because we don't even know that it's there. You're simply downloading the wallet and you're uh, putting that inf your information in the wallet and you can ask for that to be certified. And any of these interactions that you have are one-off interactions with specific service providers. There's no central repo where we're somehow farming or collecting your data. And we feel like because of that, it leads to a much more transparent and, and fair way to exchange information because you don't have this information asymmetry where the internet 
you know, giants of the world really have made their billions from your data and, and you really don't get paid for it. Um, and when we talk about financial data, this is a very important subsector of your data, right? It has tax implications, privacy implications, freedom and, and wealth implications. So I feel like this is really one of the most important questions of our time is who has access to my data where, where is my data sitting and who has access to it? Because as we move into the digital age where we're just so much more meshed in this world online, we, we really want to be able to keep track of where is our data. And the way that we're starting the self-key network is, is making a very tangible application for you to be able to access real world products and services, such as setting up a bank account, setting up an e-wallet account and applying for that instantly online. So that's sort of a little bit of the roadmap of where we are now versus where we might go in the future. Yeah, and so you don't have to do this over and over and over for each financial institution. I don't have to go get my certified uh, utility bill or my certified passport for every single institution that I want to apply to. I get it. I check it into the system. I'm part of this community, and we store it. We hash it and store it on the blockchain. I say we. I have no affiliation at the moment with, with SelfKey. I'm saying we because I was part of this system, this old legacy banking system for a very long time. Um, it kind of reminds me, Edmund, of how phones, how smartphones will come up now and say, hey, this app requests your microphone, requests your contacts, and requests your camera. Is it kind of similar with KeepKey? With, with SelfKey? Yeah. It's exa- I, <laughs> so I keep saying KeepKey because it's a, it's a new hardware wallet that I've got that has ShapeShift integrated into it, and I love it. With SelfKey is what I mean. Yeah, shout out to Eric Voorhees, and, and ShapeShift is, is a great product. Um, as it relates to SelfKey, uh, it will work very similar to a notification on your phone that will pop up, and it'll say, XYZ company is asking for your information. Is this correct? And of course, if you didn't authorize that share, then you would just click no and you'd be certainly uh, very safe. If you did want to share that information, you'd click yes and that information would flow from your phone to wherever service provider. And just to be clear, there, your information isn't being stored on the blockchain. What we do do is store hash of your information on the blockchain. So we're getting semi technical here. Um, when we say hash, what we mean is that there's a one way function which takes, say, a picture of your passport and image uh, and then creates a string of letters and text that if that one way function is ever run on that same passport image, we'll get the same result. And that allows us to know that this information for sure was meant to be sent. It was sent on this date. It was sent on uh, whatever specific date. And you can prove that. You can go back in time and say, we really did share this exact document with you five years ago and you have access to my passport and therefore now you should please delete it Mr. Banker because you have my data and and we're starting to enter into a world where governments are actually going to protect people against companies that lose your data a bit more so for instance there's a landmark legislation in the EU called GDPR which penalizes company with four percent of global revenue as a penalty if they ever lose your data and so anyway we're, we're starting to see Uh, the opportunities emerge for a self-sovereign identity system like this, whereas in the past, we might not have been able to to build such a system. We have the enablement of blockchain. We have a proliferance of of different fintech services and different fintech options where 20 years ago, you'd have to go to a single financial institution for every financial product. Now you have the benefit as a consumer of picking very specific products for specific needs from specific companies instead of kind of this end all be all to one large dominating financial institution that provides you with everything. Yeah. It's like, instead of trusting Equifax to have all of your information and being the go-to company to prove who you are, what your, um, what your credit rating or credit score is. And, you know, these people hired a, a music major as their chief information officer. I mean, I don't know who you trust more, somebody that can sing a B-flat concert scale to protect your digital identity or a, a hashed mathematical encrypted base blockchain where you don't have your information stored on someone else's server. You know, I do see this as a revolution in helping people protect their own personal identity. I mean, like they've been said, you know, you, you, up to this point, we've had a lot of experience protecting our physical selves, right? We know how to hide gold in our houses. We know how to hide that, you know, grandma's diamond ring somewhere or how to bury money. I I have no clue or how, how to keep yourself physically safe and protected, but we don't have a lot of experience 
keeping our digital selves safe and protected, our digital identities. And we've been giving it away to all of these companies for so long where people think that Facebook is free, right? People think that all of this stuff is free, but you're selling them and giving away your most valuable asset, which is you, which is your identity, with allowing them to do different type of psychological studies on you and what you thumb up and how you react to stuff and you know what information you put up on these, these platforms, these centralized types of platforms. Could you imagine, could you imagine how much information about you somebody could find out if they hacked Facebook servers. Just think about that. Think about every post that you've posted. Think about everything you've thumbed up or liked, everything you've retweeted, every picture that you've taken that who knows what type of identifying algorithms they have in the background to see where you are, who you hang out with. I mean, we're really approaching a world where either you're going to take your digital identity seriously or someone else is going to for you. And most likely they don't have your best interest in heart, which leads me to the freedom idea. Like how do you see a company or a project like self key helping people become more free and in control over their own personal lives? Sure. I mean, I have, uh, thought about this question a lot, especially running flag theory, which our motto is that we try to help provide individuals with more freedom, uh, privacy and wealth. And when we think about freedom, to me, that means the right to sort of move and have a choice to be somewhere or, or do something. And when, when you're restricted from that, you might say that you're less free. So I think that if you look at the categories that are available on the self key marketplace, you know, the first one that we worked on was citizenship. So you can go and you can browse and you can look at literally where you can become a new citizen of the world and get a new passport. This is perfectly legal. It's above board. There's nothing untoward about it. And you can shop and, and look, uh, not just theoretically, but actually uh, start to fill out the application using self key um, to be able to become a new citizen or a new resident of a new jurisdiction and to be able to access other financial products such as uh, gold storage or uh, e-wallets. To me, the, the opportunity to have choice and to be able to be an informed uh, consumer of this information um, because we, we've really been accustomed to kind of having financial services um, not be easy to sign up for and, and be quite uh, opaque in terms of the pricing. And what we're, we're, we're trying to change that. We're trying to put these different financial service providers next to each other one by one. And, and eventually, if we have enough traction with SelfKey, we can actually start demanding as consumers that uh, these financial service providers adopt the self key uh, ecosystem because it's completely open source. It's uh, free to use essentially, except for the native token. And uh, we believe that it leads to a much safer and more secure world and a world with much more freedom for the self key users. So that that's sort of the ethos that that's driving us. Yeah. So let's talk about the roadmap uh, of self key who's on your team. And I think you guys are doing an ICO sometime soon. Talk to us about that. Yeah, so our lawyers have advised us to call it a token distribution event, a TDE, because uh, ICO sounds a lot like IPO, and it conveys when you're when you do an IPO, you're basically selling equity in a company, and and you're giving some uh, rights to prove future profits of the company. In in this case, we're, we're not doing that. We've set up a nonprofit foundation, so there should not be any expectations. Uh, of profits from from the organization because the organization won't make profits. Um, but what we do have is we have a native token which fuels the economy um, within SelfKey. So anytime that you'd like to get a document certified, you simply pay that certifying body with a bit of key. Anytime that a relying party is now relying upon that information from the certifying party, they would be paying that that certifying party with key. If you weren't wanted to go shopping in the marketplace and there was something that cost a bit of money, say a setup of an LLC in a bank account in the US, you'd pay a token amount, an arbitrary amount in key equivalent to sort of the price in, in, in fiat currency, which that um, product would be available from. Um, so that's that's sort of what's uh, on our immediate roadmap. So we, we're setting that up. A lot of that's been already set up and we're releasing that key token. Um, so we'll be having a public sale of that token in Q4. It's looking like uh, late October is when that will be that will be starting. So on our team, we have uh, a number of technologists, so 
coming as a, as a tech company at this problem, uh, we realized that we need to get a lot of legal help. So we've engaged with several uh, very reputable law firms, including Appleby Glo Global, um, who's been helping us in, in several jurisdictions, as well as Silk Legal and uh, some other uh, U.S. securities lawyers um, all together and a tech team of around 15 people. Um, those are all transparent and available on our website. So if I got the, the numbers wrong, just go there, selfkey.org, and you can see their shining faces and, and sort of what they do for the product. But uh, in any event, we, we do have sort of a, a large team that's working on this at this point. Altogether, we're around 40, 45, the last time I checked this morning, and uh, trying to grow quickly. We see this as there's a window of opportunity in the space to really have a, a predominant um, digital identity ecosystem and, and a, and a organization that's kind of leading and paving the way there and, and we're very open to uh, having new people join us uh, both as uh, volunteers employees uh, people who contribute by buying some key tokens uh, relying parties who might have their own fintech companies these are the type of organizations and individuals who we're looking to connect with and is this only for individuals to protect their own digital identity or can corporations and in institutions use this as well Absolutely. Uh, institutions and corporations can use it. At this point, we're sort of targeting smaller businesses. Uh, smaller businesses are, are much easier to work with, quite frankly, and, and uh, it's much more likely that you'd need a new bank account if you're a small startup. One of the interesting things about starting a company is that sometimes it's very difficult to get a bank account set up. So, you know, for instance, if you look at a place like Hong Kong, uh, now it's become almost impossible for a foreign company to go in and set up a bank account. There's There's a whole gambit of paperwork that's required it takes several weeks or even months and we're trying to make this we're trying to solve that problem so that if you start a new company you're able to instantly get a bank account you're able to instantly get a company and you're able to focus on the things which really matter in your business marketing and sales and getting your product to to market not not the the legal back office and the paperwork we want to take that on for you and, and uh do the dirty work so when is the TDE, the token distribution event, happening? And are there any restrictions on people that you're not accepting? At this point, the TDE is scheduled for October 30th, and we will not be accepting any uh, Chinese uh, nationals at this point. And, and also probably going to be excluding U.S. persons as well. Two communist countries that unfortunately cannot take part of any TDEs or ICOs moving forward. That's really unfortunate, but I understand from a, uh, from a legal perspective why you would choose that. Let's hope that these stupid governments get their stuff together and they can give the guidance that, so that business owners and entrepreneurs like Edmund feel more comfortable and their legal teams feel more comfortable opening up and offering these types of offerings to the people of the world. Otherwise, we're just going to miss out, unfortunately. Um, Edmund, what else would you would like to cover here? Yeah, good question. Um, I guess, you know, if you're thinking about participating in this, you should probably understand and know what a, what a token generation event or, or as it's sometimes called an ICO is. And there's a lot of them happening right now at the moment. And a lot of them are, uh, how should I say, less than reputable. Um, I think you should really just as a, as a disclaimer, always do your due diligence on any project which you're thinking about. Um, contributing money or, or time to. And I hope that when you do the due diligence on our project, you see that there's actually a lot there. Um, we've been working on this project for several years. We have a real team with real people working on this and we have real technology, which is backing it. And uh, we've hoped that we've made that obvious, but um, we, we also have communities where you can come and you can ask us questions. So at self key on telegram, um, if you go on our website, selfkey.org, that's the official website and any of the official links to our social media accounts are, are posted there. So also be wary about scammers who impersonate a project and aren't actually that project. There's, there's a whole lot of risk in this space, um, quite frankly. Uh, token events are sort of this new frontier and it's a bit of the Wild West at the moment, but there's also a whole lot of opportunity in this space. You know, if you look at one uh, Thai company that did a token sale a couple months ago called Omise Go. At the time, Omise Go raised around $25 million worth of tokens, and now their market capitalization for OMG is over a billion dollars in just a few short months. So the people who got in on that initial token sale have gone and 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 done fantastically well. Now, I'm not suggesting that you would uh, get 
get uh, similar results from our product, but I'm just uh, mentioning this in light of the larger phenomena, which is token sales right now. I mean, if you don't know about this or you haven't heard of the term ICO, you may have been living under a rock because it's been uh, it's been an unbelievable year in 2017. I mean, it's been, I think, over $2 billion that's been raised, and it's really disrupting the VC model. So if you wanted to, to talk about that, I'm, I'm happy to, because I just think it's fantastic that um, we're seizing the power back from sort of the old guard, and, and it's becoming much more democratized. Um, every, everything in the, our world seems to be becoming more democratized, but in particular, the space. Yeah, and I think the powers that be can see this. They can smell it. They see that we're able to self-fund, right, and that we can raise money and create value and create our own money from within, and we don't need them. And so there's, if, there's one, if there's two things the government can't stand, it's when they start feeling like we don't need them and when we laugh at them. And in the crypto space, we're doing both regularly. Because we've out innovated them, so we're laughing at their old technologies like the Swift system, which was built for fax machines and it's not cryptographically backed and still requires a whole heap of ridiculous um, human input to make that international money movement system work. We built blockchains, right? We have the ability to self fund now and create value where our ideologically similar peers, a lot of us are based on libertarian or free market principles. We understand money and we've built a system, an eco ecosystem where we can self fund. And so we're no longer dependent on their old regulations and their old banking model and their old legal models. It just doesn't apply anymore. So that said, it's still very, Early, I would say that 2017 was probably the first year that anyone had heard of an ICO, specifically that term. You know, some old school people remember the Ethereum ICO back in 2014 or some of these older ICOs, but never has it been as popular or as right in your face or on the news as it is right now. But like Edmund said, you've got to do your own due diligence, investing in an ICO or any type of token event is the same as investing in any company if you don't know the company if you're looking just to make a profit and to turn a quick buck to flip a coin you're probably going to lose your money you don't invest more than you can lose and there's tons of resources out there now to help you um, evaluate a, a token project you know i'll give a shout out to bruce fenton who released a really good guideline he calls it the spacesuitx.org, spacesuitx.org. It's just that's an acronym for all the various things that he looks for in a, in a token project before he would invest in it. So, you know, go out there and, and take the time and do the reading and get yourself educated and know what you're doing because there is a lot of opportunity here. But if you're not careful and you're just throwing money at new coins, then you are going to lose that wealth and you know what they say about a fool and his wealth um edmund if anyone would like to keep up with you or the project how should they do it yeah i think telegram is the best way um at self key on telegram is is probably the most effective way you can also go to our website and sign up for a mailing list where we'll be doing some updates and kind of informing you on the on the status of the project and uh, if you want to do your research on us, I would say read our white paper. We've got 33 pages where we've really broken it down in, in granular detail, how we plan on rolling out the system, what exactly we've implemented. And I think when you're looking at a, at a token project just in general, you want to look for several things. One of them is, is does it make sense that this product is actually decentralized? Another one would be has the team executed before and do they have proof that they're able to execute on this type of thing you know have they got their accounting and legal in place and are they actually um, legitimate with the way that they're rolling out their token or is this just a fly-by-night project which is going to go away to tomorrow you know what what does the community look like what does the team look like um, is this product actually usable to me if you're buying tokens for a product which you don't even know what it does or how it would ever be useful to you then i would say take a pass um, and and you should also look at who are their partners do they have 
uh, any kind of industry institutional backing? Um, does it look like they have the technical things uh, taken care of? I mean, I'm, I'm taking this a lot of this from spacebootx.org site, but uh, it's, it's fantastic in terms of how they do a weighting and a rating system. I think the one thing sort of missing in the in the token space at the moment is, is rigor around how a project is analyzed. Um, I feel like people see a tweet from Floyd Mayweather and they think, okay, well, this project's got to be worth investing if Floyd's behind it. You know, Floyd's a great boxer, but I don't think he knows much about blockchain or building distributed architecture for cryptographic based systems yeah or even tweets from some of the old school guys in our space i'm not going to call out names i would really like to but i'm not you know, even if you see a tweet from one of the og crypto guys don't take it on their word like actually build the your own authority to know how to analyze some of these uh, some of these projects, but I, I think we've covered it here. I, I think, you know, anybody listening to this now knows where we stand on this whole ICO thing. Um, Edmund, thank you so much for coming on the show. You know, we don't have a whole lot of repeat guests, but we happen to be here in Chiang Mai, Thailand together. It's an amazing city. If you've never been, you know, please come visit us. And until next time, keep building freedom. Thanks again for listening to Liberty Entrepreneurs episode 72, Protect Yourself from Identity Theft with Blockchain Keys using selfkey.org, featuring guest Edmund John Lowell. If you want to keep up with their project, all of the social media links are in the show notes, libertyentrepreneurs.com forward slash selfkey. If you have a chance and you found value in this episode, please share it with a friend. Jump on iTunes. Give us a rating. It helps a ton. Want to hear somebody on the show? Send us an email. Info at libertyentrepreneurs.com. Tell us who it is and why you think they would be a good fit. And we'll do everything we can to get them on. So signing out from Chiang Mai, Thailand. Until next time, keep building freedom. Peace.